Abby. Um, so welcome to everyone to the UNC Core Center for Clinical Research Speaker Series. I'm um, glad to have you all here with us today, and I'm particularly excited to have Star Brooker with us. Um, Star is a, an assistant professor in the Department of Behavioral Nursing Science, um, the only department I've ever heard of by that specific name, which I think is really interesting. Um, and she's at the University of Florida, as you can see by her nice background. Um, Star has done some really good work and it continues to do a lot of really good work um, in the space of chronic pain, particularly among older adults. And she's going to be talking to us today about making the move to understanding or to understand movement of book pain and musculoskeletal research. Um, she's going to talk for about 45 minutes and um, we'll have plenty of time for a Q&A at the end. All right, start whenever you're ready. All right, thank you. Well, good morning, everyone. Let me get my screen up and going. All right, are you seeing slides or notes? Just the slide. Looks good. Perfect, okay. So um, I'm talking about basically how do we shift to understanding movement evoke pain from general pain or spontaneous and rest pain. And if you were, um, if you attended the IASP World Congress, um, some of the slides may be a bit familiar because um, I talked about how do we measure movement evoke pain um, in musculoskeletal conditions. And so I'll be sharing a little bit about the measurement and um, kind of where we are in terms of understanding kind of the whole science of movement evoke pain. So interestingly, um, I wanted to see what AI said about movement evoke pain. Um, to really see how mainstream this whole construct, concept, phenomena, whatever you want to call it, um, if it had made it to quote unquote mainstream. And so Google AI, when I asked for a definition of movement evoke pain, um, it said that it's a type of pain that occurs during or after movement, whether active or passive, and that it's different from resting or pain that's recalled. So I decided to take a step further and put it into chat GPT. Um, and, and this time I wanted to know the state of the science of movement evoke pain. And essentially they just laid out kind of the major areas in which research has been conducted in terms of understanding movement evoke pain. So um, it gave us mechanisms of movement evoke, evoke pain, the assessment and measurement, some of the clinical implications, um, pain mechanisms and chronic pain, some patient-centered approaches to um, assessing and managing pain, what are some of the preventive and rehabilitative strategies, and lastly, how are we integrating these research findings? Um, so really looking at basic science and some of the clinical studies. So I thought, okay, well, we're making some progress. Even AI is recognizing that this is a growing area um, of research. So just to start out, you know, why is it important to understand and to measure movement evoke pain? Well, we know from some of the research, of course, that movement evoke pain does predict functional and work disability, but it also predicts surgical outcomes. Um, and we're also seeing now that it impacts coping and a lot of the psychological um, coping strategies, whether they are considered um, adaptive or maladaptive. They're also playing a major part either as a mediator in the relationship between movement evoke pain and functional outcomes and or um, pain sensitivity. So in general, what's the relationship between pain and movement? Well, both pain and movement are universally relevant phenomena that influence the human experience in readily observable ways. Both pain and movement are necessary for life actions. 
Pain and movement are both protective mechanisms in their own respective right. So for pain, it does serve as an alert system, especially for acute pain, right? To alert us that something may be going on in our bodies. Um, and then movement is also protective in that continuing to move um, prevents negative outcomes such as disability and mobility issues um, and other complications, especially after surgery, right? So they're both protective and they're both important um, for different reasons. And we know that there are reciprocal relationships between pain and movement, such that pain affects movement while movement affects pain. And I'll kind of show you these relationships in the next slide. So what do these relational patterns between pain and movement look like? Well, if you've seen any of my presentations on movement evoke pain over the past two years, then you've probably seen this slide. Um, but essentially, pain changes movement patterns and movement changes pain patterns, right? Pain can inhibit movement and movement can facilitate pain. And this is where we get movement evoke pain. Pain can worsen or impair movement, but movement can improve pain. And this talks about movement evoke analgesia. When pain is lower, people tend to move more. But in the reverse, when movement is lower, um, then, well, when pain is higher, movement is lower. So people tend to move less because they're trying to, in their minds, protect their joints or just rest and hope that the pain will subside. So these are kind of the five patterns that we see between pain and movement. Now, it's interesting that um, some of the early work in movement evoked pain was done in mice or rats with cancer pain. And then the work um, began to move into looking at movement evoked pain in um, human patients after surgical procedures. And a lot of this early work in surgical movement evoked pain was done by Dr. Ian Gilron. But over the past 15 years, um, there have been a number of conceptual and empirical papers that have really challenged us to think about the relationships between pain and movement um, to determine if um, rest slash spontaneous pain and movement evoked pain are indeed unique constructs. And more recently, how do we improve precision measurement of movement evoked pain and use it to predict outcomes and tailor treatments. So some of these papers have proposed some uh, dynamic graphical models to demonstrate the interaction of pain and movement. And we'll look at some of these models now in the next slide. So these are three um, models um, that really show, I guess, a different lens on the relationship between um, pain and movement. So in the first model, the pain and movement reasoning model, um, it was really designed to help improve or facilitate uh, better clinical reasoning and judgment by combining the, um, by considering the combined influence of some of the physiological, cognitive, emotional, and social inputs on neurophysiological mechanisms and what this model helps us do, it helps to move us to identify, um, you know, the relative contribution of each of these three kind of major categories to the person's pain presentations and their movement dysfunction, and then to tailor the management to the principal influence or to the principal category. So if their pain is uh, primarily stimulated, let's say, by um, CNS modulation, well, then that's the area that we'll focus on in terms of identifying the best treatments, whether they're medications or manual treatments. So then the second model, the one in the middle, um, this is an integrative model um, 
really helping us to think or move us from looking at pain and movement to pain with movement. Um, and so really looking at pain and movement as kind of a dynamic relationship rather than separate processes. And so this particular model integrates pain with movement and it requires us to first understand kind of the uniform or standard nervous system processes for nociception, pain and movement and motor control. And then to look at kind of the dynamic and adapted nervous uh, system changes that lead to this integrative response of pain with movement. And then kind of the most recent model is this pain and movement interface, um, which kind of shows us um, the complexity and the individual factors that really influence um, not only pain and movement, but even resting pain and some of the um, outcomes, right? So the pain and movement interface, the primary out components are movement evoked pain, pain interference, and activity engagement. And together, these three things, um, along with their quality and quantity, leads to behavioral abilities. So it leads to either ability or disability in some regard. And so this particular model helps to move us to understand how movement evoked pain is a um, dynamic phenomenon that fluctuates based on the type and intensity of movement, as well as the time frame and context in which it occurs. But it also helps us to understand the pain specific pathways that lead to varying um, severities of disability. So here's another kind of crude conceptualization of mine, um, really looking at the pain with movement and the interaction between the two. Um, and so as we think about these different models of pain and movement, it's really important that we consider um, the interaction of these other factors, right, such as the disease or the pain syndrome or the, um, so for example, maybe it's osteoarthritis or fibromyalgia, to look at the mechanism or the type of pain, so whether it falls into more of a nociceptive or neuropathic or nociplastic um, type of pain. Uh, to consider a person's normative behaviors and beliefs. So what do they believe about movement when they're having pain? Because that influences um, the degree of movement evoked pain that they may report. And then also looking at um, how the brain is activated and how it responds to the combined inputs of pain and motor activity. So before we go any further, um, I think it's important that we kind of establish, um, you know, a foundation or, or give you a definition of movement evoked pain. And so this is kind of a working definition, um, but essentially movement evoked pain is pain um, that is acutely provoked or experienced in response to active or passive movement of the involved tissues. It's different from pain that occurs without any movement or that is constant regardless of activity. So when we think about movement evoked pain, we think about it in terms of it being stimulus dependent or stimulus evoked, which means there has to be something that evokes the pain, which in this case would be movement or physical activity. And people define movement in a lot of different ways depending on your discipline. So movement and physical therapy may be defined differently than how um, nursing or even perhaps how um, people in applied kinesiology um, might define movement. So movement is defined based on whatever discipline you're in. Um, but when we look at pain at rest, that is stimulus independent. So it's just a pain that occurs without any real um, observable stimulus. Whoops. Okay. So when we think about measuring or assessing pain, um, Ebert and Kern stated that pain assessments completed while the patient is at rest are likely to be inaccurate as pain levels and indicators will increase during movement. 
and providers are encouraged to ensure pain assessments are not taken solely while the patient is at rest. And so the pain assessment continuum, um, a lot of times we are either asking patients or participants to recall their pain. So maybe within the last a few hours or the last 24 hours or the last week, or we're asking them in the moment about their pain, but we're not distinguishing between the pain that they're having at rest and the pain that they're having with any type of movement. So the question really is, is movement evoked pain mechanistically different than spontaneous or rest pain? And we could argue that yes, it is distinctly different mechanistically, but also it's different from a phenomenological and experiential standpoint. We could also argue that movement evoked pain is a continuum of spontaneous pain that is exacerbated by, by functional or physical movement. Um, so for example, you might have pain at rest and then it increases with movement so would this be an exacerbation of spontaneous arrest pain or is this movement evoked pain? And so that's kind of the gray area um, that we have to explore. Um, and, you know, currently we don't really know um, a lot about the two distinctions, right? Um, are they truly distinct or is it a continuum? So um, in this study, um, they used a 10-item self-report questionnaire methodology to distinguish between rest pain and evoked pain in chronic neuropathic conditions. Um, and the questionnaire is called the Finesse Pain Questionnaire. Um, and essentially what we see for the different types of um, activities is that having a combination of evoked and spontaneous pain is higher than either evoked or spontaneous pain alone. Um, and so this tells us that each type of pain does have its own unique characteristics that when they are experienced together, it, it's amplified, not only in the intensity but also increases interference with daily physical activities and emotional well-being. But what this also shows us is that movement evoked pain is not always more intense than spontaneous pain. Um, because initially our thinking was that movement evoked pain will be much higher than spontaneous pain. Um, but now we're seeing some data that shows it really is dependent on a lot on several different factors whether or not movement evoked pain is higher than spontaneous or rest pain. So let's look at a couple of examples from some of my data. Um, so this was a sample of 83 black older adults um, where I measured resting pain or kind of their baseline. So when they first came into the lab, um, after they had rested for about five or so minutes, we asked them to rate the amount of pain that they were having in their knee. And then prior to beginning the first movement evoked activity, we asked them to rate their pain. And so this is the SPPB baseline. And then we asked them to rate their pain immediately after completing the movement evoked activity. And it's interesting because what we see is that both baseline pains are higher than the actual pain that they experience during the activity. So I really don't know how to explain this, but what I'm thinking is that in this particular sample, that resting pain is a combination of movement and underlying spontaneous pain that with short periods of rest, and a low intensity, low impact task, such as standing balance, um, driven by mechanical pressure versus joint manipulation, the pain decreases. Um, so let's look at 
a second figure. And so the second figure compared movement evoked pain between black and white older adults with NEOA again. Um, and it shows us that one, baseline pain, baseline resting pain is higher in blacks than in whites. And that the pain during knee flexion and extension increases and decreases in both blacks and whites, but it's not at the same rate. So for whites, the pain decreases immediately after the movement stop, and then it kind of plateaus off at 30 and 60 seconds, and it remains above their resting baseline. On the other hand, for our African American group, it takes longer to decrease um, for the pain to decrease after the movement, and the pain decreases below their resting baseline. However, at one minute out or one minute post movement, the pain begins to increase again, which tells us that there's some dysregulation in their ability to sustain inhibitory responses. In addition, it could be that spontaneous pain might be temporally summated hypersensitivity from activities of daily living. And so this particular figure points to my next, uh, leads to my next point about understanding the different temporal responses to movement of book pain. So earlier this year, we published a paper um, trying to better conceptualize movement evoke pain and also to try to understand um, the different patterns of movement evoke pain. Um, and as you can see here, there are several temporal patterns that we observe in individuals with chronic pain. So in some cases, um, the pain does not change with movement. In other cases, the pain increases and then it slowly decreases. But in other circumstances, the pain may initially increase and then it may plateau over time. So I think it's important that we really, in our analyses, that we really start to tease out um, the different temporal patterns that people are experiencing so we can better understand um, the different mechanisms that may be leading to these different experiences um, between individuals. So when we examine temporal patterns, it's also important to assess not only the change in intensity, but also looking at kind of the spatial spread and the quality of the pain. And so one way that I'm measuring spatial change in particular is to ask participants how much of their knee is hurting and participants rate this from zero to 100%. So I get a baseline and then I get a rating after, I get a rating baseline. And then in some cases I get a rating during the activity and after the activity. Um, and I've just kind of started to look at this data. So I didn't include it in the presentation today, um, but I really wanted to know more about how the movement impacts um, how the pain either spreads or stays the same, um, and to understand what areas of the knee that it spreads to, right? So is it the anterior, posterior, is it the medial or the lateral? So here's another example um, of temporal patterns by Dr. Corey Simon and his work in, uh, I think it's chronic low back pain. And so you can see here four different patterns, right? So in A, um, pain is actually alleviated by movement, um, which I've seen some of this in my own sample is in older African-Americans that after uh, several movement evoked activities, their pain actually begins to decrease. And I think this has to do kind of with this whole exercise, analgesia and stuff like that. Um, and then we also see in B that MEP initially, they have movement evoked pain initially, and then it decreases with continued movement. And then in C, that movement evoked pain primarily um, is experienced with the walking piece of their movement task. And then in D, 
that movement evoked pain is maintained or increased with continued movement. So um, there are a lot of different ways that we can really examine these different patterns of movement evoke pain. Um, there's no standard way. In fact, this is all helping to contribute to advancing kind of the science of movement evoke pain. So as we think about the relationship between resting pain, evoked pain, and the possibility of having a combination of both spontaneous and movement evoked pain, I've conceived three levels of pain evocation. So the primary or the base level, um, this is a person who does not have pain. Um, and begins with no pain in movement or the activity evokes pain. And so this will be considered pain that's produced by movement. The secondary level um, is when a person presents or they already have pain and the movement exacerbates kind of the underlying pain or it induces a new type or a new location of pain. And so this secondary level goes back to whether or not uh, movement evoked pain is actually a continuum from rest pain. And then kind of at the third level or the tertiary level, um, this is when an external stimulus induces pain. Um, and I'm still trying to kind of tease out exactly what this looks like, but, you know, it could be that um, it's uh, a, a re related to loading and posture. Um, and so, for example, standing for a long period of time may exert pressure on the joint and cause muscle contraction, which then causes the pain with movement. So it's kind of like there's something else that exerts a stimulus to induce that pain. So um, we, we have more research kind of showing evidence of primary and secondary evocation, but um, not a lot about um, the complexity of MEP, so maybe that tertiary, tertiary level. And so in thinking about, you know, how we are understanding movement evoked pain and then how we are measuring movement evoked pain, it's important to think about how we're defining it. And currently there's no standardized definitions or nomenclature for movement evoked pain. Um, so the definition and the terminology that you use to describe movement evoked pain will drive how you measure movement evoked pain. And then that will have practical consequences for your research as well as translation into clinical practice. So here are some examples from the literature about how people are defining movement evoked pain. And then these are some of the related term, terms or concepts. So really until we get clear on what we are defining, um, we will see a lot of different ways in which people are measuring movement evoked pain, how they are quantifying movement evoked pain, and then how they are looking at the relationship between that and different um, outcomes. So, for example, if your definition of movement evoked pain is pain with walking, then your movement evoked tests that you would use would be some type of short and long distance walking you might also include some type of gait analysis as a functional outcome. So again, there's kind of this wide spectrum of testing paradigms um, in terms of looking at movement evoked pain. And it ranges from high test standardization to more individualized and patient specific tasks. So So when we think about what would be the best or most appropriate like evoke pain test to do with different um 
with different conditions or pain conditions. These are just some examples. And this slide was developed by um, Katie Butera for um, another presentation that we did together. And so, for example, if you're looking at Achilles tendinopathy, you might try to isolate a particular joint movement and that could be made with some repeated calf raises versus um, someone maybe with low back pain. You might do like the back performance scale or a stair climb scale. So it really depends on the condition, but also the population um, that you're working with in terms of which um, testing paradigm that you use. Um, so here's an example of a movement evoke pain protocol for low back pain by Corey Simon, um, which includes four different tests, rising from a chair in 30 seconds, um, doing a trunk rotation, um, reaching, and then the six minute, six minute walk test. So pretty simple, four tasks, right? Versus um, this very convoluted protocol, which is mine, and um, I'm still trying to figure out um, the best way to really analyze and isolate some of these um, outcomes. Um, so this particular protocol was meant to understand how different intensities of movement evoke pain tests, um, how it impacts pain and movement. So starting with more low intensity and then gradually increasing to higher intensity activities. So a lower intensity activity would be the SPPB or the short physical performance battery, which looks at balance and short distance walking and chair stands and all that versus a higher intensity, which would be looking at stair climbs or using the biodex um, to measure different parameters of um, range of motion with the knee during flexion and extension. So, again, there are numerous methods and protocols that are used to induce and measure movement evoke pain, and this contributes to the current lack of standardization and complexity in understanding movement evoke pain. Um, so let's see. Okay. I think I skipped this slide. Maybe I didn't. All right. So let's look at some different ways of evoking and measuring pain. Um, so when we look at exhibit A, this was using the short performance, um, the short physical performance battery or the SPPB. Uh, in blacks and whites with NEOA or those who were at risk for NEOA. Um, in this particular study um, that was done or led, the PI was Roger Fillinger, um, this particular secondary data analysis. Um, so in that study, we didn't measure resting or spontaneous pain, so we really don't have a baseline. Um, but what we did notice is that there are significant differences in movement evoked pain um, between Blacks and Whites. In fact, pain intensity scores in Blacks were nearly twice as high as Whites. In Exhibit B with chronic low back pain, uh, movement evoked pain was present in 81.3% of Whites. But one thing I want to point out with these two examples um, is how important it's also to understand another aspect of movement evoke pain, which is identifying people who don't report any movement evoke pain. So in exhibit A, there were fewer blacks who reported having no movement evoke pain compared to whites. And one of the examples was the walking pain. So 34% of blacks said they didn't have any movement evoke pain, while 51% of blacks uh, 51% of whites say that they experienced no movement evoked pain. And then in exhibit B, there was about 17% who said they had no movement evoked pain. And again, we see differences in that there are less blacks who report no movement evoked pain than whites. So really blacks are at a disadvantage either way you look at it. Either they have higher movement evoked pain or there's fewer Blacks that have no movement evoke pain. So 
So how do we quantify movement evoke pain intensity? Um, so again, scoring depends on what aspect of the movement evoke pain experience you're interested in understanding and also what level of evocation uh, the person is on. So whether they start at kind of the primary level or the secondary level. And so um, here are five different ways um, that you can quantify movement evoke pain, right? So you can uh, construct a sum score or an aggregate score where you're just kind of summing all your post-test ratings. And your question might be, you know, does a battery of tests elicit or evoke pain? The second way would be to just look at the average individual post-movement ratings. And so for this, you might simply just want to know how much pain does a single movement or physical activity result in? The third way is to look at the average of all post raising post ratings. Um, so this is kind of like a mean score of all the activities. And your question might be, after repeated tasks, what is the average pain experience during and after these tasks? And then the fourth way is to um, construct a, a change score. Um, and you can think about this change score in two different ways. So you can look at it as in you're trying to understand whether or not a particular movement actually evokes or worsens pain. Or you can look at it to determine whether or not you are seeing like a clinically or statistically important change or difference. And then the last way is to look at kind of a peak rating or a maximum rating. Um, and so thinking about which tests or which movements evoke the most or discriminate between mild, moderate, and severe pain. So I hope this makes sense. Um, I can send these slides out. And if you have questions, feel free to put those in the chat. Um, so in thinking about, you know, kind of moving us from our current um, disposition of still kind of just focusing on general pain or rest pain, uh, we wanted to determine the relationship between movement evoked pain with different biopsychosocial factors because it's important that we begin to kind of characterize movement evoked pain. And so we attempted to kind of develop these seven domains, uh, mechanical factors, modulatory mechanisms, looking at kind of the different mixed types of pain, whether or not it was mobility limiting, what are the mediating and moderating factors? What are the management strategies that work best for movement evoked pain? But also what are kind of the molecular and neural um, structures or mechanisms behind movement evoked pain? So this is what we attempted to do using kind of some advanced statistical modeling. Um, we wanted to to really look at kind of the, the network relationships between our movement evoked pain um, variables, which were the SPPB, chair pain, walk pain, balance pain, and to see, you know, how they are related to all of those different factors from those seven domains. Um, and I won't focus too much on the figure on the left, but the figure on the right um, is a weighted correlation network analysis. And let me make sure, where is it? And basically it just shows how these different factors kind of cluster together. And so um, we, we were really looking to see um, not only how they're related, but kind of the strength of those relationships. And it's interesting because we didn't really find um, that our movement evoked pain variables were related to some of the things that we initially kind of hypothesized. Um, in fact, they really just were related to some of the other mechanical pain factors um, and some of the QST or the pain sensitivity. 
variables. So it's making us kind of rethink how all of these um, how all of these factors are related to movement evoke pain. Again, it could just be that our movement evoke pain variables um, just don't correlate well with these other variables. So again, a lot of this depends on what you're measuring and how you're measuring it. So um, just want to leave you kind of with some food for thought in terms of measuring movement evoked pain and understanding the mechanisms, um, some questions that I've been thinking about and questions that um, others and I have talked about. Um, for example, do we need to look at how long it takes for a person to get back to their baseline after a movement, right? And then what constitutes a baseline? Is it the very beginning of the session or is it right before the activity? You know, should we be assessing like kind of this total movement evoke pain at the end of the session, kind of like a cumulative movement evoke pain? But also we need to think about in terms of our protocols, what is considered rest for participants? Should there be a standard resting period? And how should we account for that in our analyses? Um, should we measure the time to complete the activity and consider that as an important aspect of the temporal experience? And then just some other kind of biological um, outcomes. You know, do we need to measure blood pressure before and after a movement and look at that in terms of um, trying to understand the relationship between pain and movement? But as we continue to advance this area, we also need to um, start to look at acute movement evoked pain and kind of the factors that influence the transition from acute movement evoked pain to chronic movement evoked pain, really um, figuring out or identifying the typology, the etiology, you know, whether movement evoked pain is a symptom, is it just an experience? Is it a type of pain? What is it, right? And then, of course, trying to standardize terminology as best as possible. Um, so, again, thinking about these different possible continuums, uh, we also need to think about research that helps us distinguish between movement evoke allodynia and movement evoke pain. Understanding the opposite effects of movement on pain and investigating the pathways in which different movements either cause movement evoke pain or movement evoke analgesia. And then also looking at it from a clinical standpoint in terms of clinical differences and improvement. So um, what's the clinically important change that is needed? Um, looking at patient driven, minimally clinically important differences, but also uh, the number to treat in terms of movement book pain and different management strategies. So with that, um, I will end my presentation and open it up to questions. Thank you, Star. I'm looking at the chat. I don't think I see anything yet. Um, anybody could feel free to either put something in the chat or, um, or just unmute and, and ask. Um, yeah, thank you, Star. Great job. I really enjoyed that. Um, I'll, I'll start with a question while we're waiting for others. Um, so our group has thought a little bit about just the idea of um, sort of fear movement and I don't know if there's resilience is quite the right word for it, but just clinically, we know there are some people who have pain and just kind of stop or slow down. And then there are other people who have pain and they kind of push through it. Um, and and I'll I'll in between. I don't mean that that's like a dichotomy, but there's that that is definitely a, a a characteristic, right? Is people's response and what they do about their pain in terms of what, how that affects their activity behavior. Um, and Grace Lowe actually did a paper in osteoarthritis, and then we repeated in another osteoarthritis sample, looking at I think she called it like activity adjusted pain, which seems to be an interesting concept rather than looking at just, and it's a little bit different, but I think related to what you're talking about with movement about pain. So instead of just using a, just pain, like the Womack or something like that, um, to look at lower extremity joint pain, factoring in people's activity. 
And that seems to be a little bit more predictive of other outcomes. In other words, people who have pain, who, but remain active tend to do a little bit better. Um, I think there's really a lot of interesting things to consider and study in that area. And I don't think it's, I don't think a whole lot has been done. So I'm just curious about your perspectives on that. If you've done anything in that area, what, what you think are maybe some important research questions or directions when we're thinking about how to study our measurement of pain in terms of, you know, people's behavior and, and what, what they do or don't do in response to that pain with respect to their activity. Yeah, so um, it kind of goes back to the one slide where I was talking about how uh, people's behaviors and beliefs uh, play into kind of that whole interaction between pain with movement and um, and some of the older African Americans that I've worked with. Um, we do see that a lot of times they are more inactive in terms of like, you know, physical activity and exercise. And when they come into the lab and we start doing all these different movement activities, um, their pain actually gets better with some things, right? And so really helping people to move from this fear avoidance standpoint to really understanding the benefits of movement and activity in helping to relieve their pain is really important. Um, I did collect some ecological momentary data um, looking at kind of their um, their current activities as well as their pain. So looking at what people were doing when they reported their pain. So whether they were, you know, walking or sitting or laying down, I haven't looked at that data yet. Um, but I do think it's important that we start to understand people's normative behaviors um, how that impacts pain movement, but also their performance on different functional tests. And then also looking at kind of their, those different psychological factors. So fear avoidance, resilience, um, hypervigilance, catastrophizing, all of those things. Yeah, thank you, Star. Um, other questions or comments? I have a question, and I'm sorry if I missed it. I had to step away for a minute, but could you talk a little bit about the role of inflammation in movement evoked pain? Is that something that you've been able to look at? Do you have any measures in terms of you know mechanism that might be related to more or less inflammation being present? Yeah, so I have not looked at inflammation. Um, that's a current project that I'm trying to hopefully get going. Um, we so in Rogers' study, uh, they did collect um, some inflammatory biomarkers. I'm not sure that they've looked at it in terms of movement evoked pain, but um, at our presentation at IASP, Dr. Ian Giron did talk about the influence of inflammatory mediators in this process. Um, I don't know that we have a lot of research on it, but we're definitely thinking that inflammation plays a part in this. What role it plays, not exactly sure. We're not sure if the inflammation piece was is directly related to whatever particular pain condition that they have, um, or or really, you know, what is its role in either rest pain and movement evoked pain. Um, so that's definitely an area that we need more research, um, but. Not not a lot so far, but but yeah. But in thinking about kind of those seven domains that I listed, um, that would be in domain seven. So kind of looking at the molecular and all of that. Yep. Okay. Thanks. Thanks for your talk. So if you don't have any questions, uh, do you have any random comments or things that you were thinking about as I was presenting, things that either did not make sense or something that you've been thinking about in terms of kind of this whole pain and movement um, interface? I have a question and I guess um, one of the things I was thinking about kind of intersects with the question. So in the protocols that you showed about the various ones to test kind of movement evoked pain, are the tasks ever randomized? 
good question. So and, and yeah, I guess with that, the intersection of my floating thought is, you know, for some people, you showed how there is hypoalgesia, and uh, presumably for those people, then that could affect their following tasks. And I know you said that you know some of the lingering questions you and several others are, have are thinking about and working on is like what kind of rest, and I assume with that, what kind of washout mm -hmm. you did to do this, right? So uh, in some of the studies that are published, um, they do randomize the task. I did not randomize the task. And that's one of the things that I probably would do differently um, would be to randomize. But, you know, I was really kind of looking at this gradual progression in task. And so I'm not sure how it would have worked with my particular protocol. Mm -hmm. But I think in the future, there's definitely something we need to think about. You know, should we be randomizing these tasks? Also, again, should we be standardizing the rest periods so that we don't have this um, kind of overlap, right? And this continuance from um, in movement evoked pain from one task to another. Because in the end, you know, if we don't give people sufficient time to rest and return to baseline, which they may not return to baseline because they may, may be having some um, dysregulation in their in their central nervous system and some pain sensitivity, which we see in a lot of African Americans, right? Um, but in really thinking about should we be giving them sufficient time. Um, to get either back to baseline or as close to baseline. And for example, in my in the biodex, we did two repetitions and we gave them a two minute rest period. And the two minute rest period seemed to do well. Um, but I've been thinking if I need to extend that and maybe to five minutes, right? So yeah, so all of that, those are all questions that I don't know that we have an answer to what's the best approach. Should we randomize? Should we not? Should we standardize? Should we not? Because a lot of this is also very individual to your population, to their particular condition or, you know, the the, um, the pain syndrome that you're interested in, but also their ability level. And that's something else we don't think about, too, especially for um, people with certain musculoskeletal conditions. Um, people are coming in at different levels of ability or disability, and that's also impacting um, the movement of pain scores. Another floating question I have, and others can feel free to interject. I will just ask since there's no one raising their hand yet. Um, is you brought this up, but then I don't think it. You know, the protocols you showed, I don't think really capture it. Is like this delayed onset pain, movement evoked pain. And I think the protocols you showed are more relative to like immediate mm -hmm. movement evoked pain. Mm -hmm. And, but you did show some models like, you know, showing like that we know this happens. And mm -hmm. I think clinically we know this happens that, that the anticipation of potential delayed onset movement evoked pain is a concern for patients. And so I yeah. just, any thoughts you had on like, ways that this might be currently being studied that wasn't kind of reflected today or or thoughts for the future on that? Yeah, I don't know if anyone's um, studying that in particular, but um, it is something, again, that we've talked about. Um, and I've, I've even considered doing kind of like a follow-up the next day, uh, which will probably move into more DOMS, but um, to see how the previous day's activities impacted um, their pain level. Um, but in my um, participants who are primarily older African American, um, a lot of the times it seems that for some of the activities that it's more pain is actually, I mean, the movements are actually helping the pain um, and not really have seen kind of this delayed onset of pain. Um, but I'm I'm sure it happens. I haven't measured it. Mm -hmm. But again, this is kind of the beauty of this whole area is that um, there's so much we don't know. And there's so many different ways that we can start to really better understand movement of pain. Thank you. Lots of lots of opportunities.
Well, we're about at the top of the hour. Um, so Star, I just wanted to thank you again. Um, certainly lots of lots of interesting questions that are unanswered and look forward to hearing more about what you and your team do next. Um, and again, thanks for, for being with us. We have one, um, just thought this was all great, great information. So thanks very much um, in the chat for you, Star. Um, thanks everybody for joining us and the audio recording will be available. So if you are, have colleagues who would like to listen to, and weren't able to be here, uh, please let, let them know about that.